Okay, the meeting is now open. Um, can I welcome members in the room with me today? I have Andy Allen, and on spotlight we have Ke the Vice Chair Kelly Armstrong and Sinead Innes and Mark Durkin. So you're all very welcome. Um, I'll go to agenda item one, which is apologies. I have an apology from Alex Easton. Um, are there any further apologies from anybody? No. Yes, Chair. Um, Karen's just going to be slightly late in this morning, and Fra is. He's somewhere in the ether. I think he's having some difficulty just logging on, but I think Oliver's trying to help him at the minute, so they should be along shortly. That's brilliant. Thank you, Sinead. Um, okay, then we'll move on to agenda item two, which is the draft minutes. Members, you'll find the minutes for the 15th of April 2021 at page six of your meeting pack. Um, can I ask members, are they content to agree the minutes as drafted? Intent? Intent. Okay, thank you. Intent, yeah. um, agenda item three is chairperson's business. I've just got a couple of things. Um, the first thing is just want to highlight that um, there was a new APG had its inaugural meeting yesterday, and that's the APG on homelessness. Um, I know there were quite a few members present at that. Um, I have taken I've been uh, taken on the role as chair of that, and Karen Mullen um, will be the vice chair. So it's just to make members aware. Um, that that has now started and all the paperwork went off yesterday afternoon um, to, to, to have that ratified then at Standards and Privileges next week. Um, then also I'd like to highlight um, that this week the BBC picked up on two research papers that we commissioned from RAIS on sports participation in Northern Ireland. Uh, members will recall that we noted these papers at the meeting on the 4th of February and agreed to schedule a briefing in due course once we had the scope to return to more normal uh, business and um, the committee team is preparing a list of briefings um, that the committee has agreed um, to take forward um, once we uh, come to the end of our committee stage of the licensing bill. Um, we'll ha then have a forward work program then to put forward to members. So I think um, that was the, the, the women in sports certainly that you had brought up, Sinead, at that time. Mm -hmm. It was mentioned during the week. Um, was yeah. with the disability sports as well, I think that Andy had brought up. So it was good to see that highlighted, albeit it was, wasn't to do with the Department of Communities, but it was good to see it brought up um, because it was mm -hmm. something that we had asked for. Okay, members, I'm going to move on then to agenda item four, which is matters arising. Um, members, we've been provided at page 28 with a ministerial letter in relation to the removal of the prohibition to sell society lottery tickets by machine. The minister intends to bring forward regulations to amend the lottery's regulations, NI 1994, to allow the sale of tickets by society lotteries by machine, namely through Facebook or the internet. The Minister highlights that during the consultation of gambling regulations, which the Department conducted last year, there was an overwhelming support for the removal of this prohibition. <coughs> the current stake limit is £1 per ticket and will remain, uh, which will mean that it is unlikely to result in gambling-related harm to any vulnerable individuals. Can I ask members, have they any comments on that, Andy? Yeah, Chair, sure. I'd just like to say I very much welcome the Minister's steps on this. I know I've been engaging with the wider sector who had highlighted this uh, anomaly in respect of our gambling legislation, which is, is very, very important as we move forward on to the various elements of the gambling legislation that will come forward. But as you highlighted, um, the, the consultation highlighted that there was overwhelming support for this, this move, and hopefully this will give um, some support to the wider sector who have been significantly impacted throughout uh, COVID. Obviously, uh, there, there was different uh, position in GB, and that now brings us in line with them also. So it's very much welcome, and I very much support the Minister in this. Just, is there, I don't see it there, Chair, is there a timeline on this, when this might be, be brought forward? Okay. Janice, have we seen any timeline on no. that? No, not a shit. We can ask for that, so we can. No, thank you, Andy. Um, any other comments members wish to make, or a content of note, or move on? Intent? Yeah. Okay. Uh, members, you've been provided a page 30 with a departmental update on the first wave of COVID labour market recovery interventions. Um, the job, start, as we know, the Job Start scheme was launched on the 2nd of April 2021, and by the 11th of April, 59 employers <laughs> had applied for funding um, for 188 opportunities. The first jobs are expected to be available from May 2021, with young people in post three to four weeks later. The Advisor Discretion uh, Fund launched on the 12th of April, all, or sorry, the 12th of April, and allows work coaches to spend up to £1,500 per annum to address the barriers that people face when trying to gain employment. Then we have the uh, uh, incentivised work experience programme. It also launched on the 12th of April. 
um, with participation payments for both employers and unemployed people and an expanded version of the scheme for young people with a longer duration and increased incentives for employers and then <coughs> finally the award of a contract on the 13th of April 2021 to introduce provision to those, help those who are work ready by providing training on core employability skills through the work ready employability services. <coughs> if you have members any comments are you content to note that? Go ahead Kelly. Uh, thank you, Chair. I just wanted to, um, if we could seek a little bit of clarification on the spread of where those opportunities are. Um, I just am very keen, and I'm sure the Minister is very keen too, to ensure that the employers who are coming into the scheme are not all based in the East um, and that we have a good spread across Northern Ireland. So I'd be interested to see a breakdown um, of where those opportunities are across um, the whole of the area. Yeah, and I suppose it, it's early days yet, so there may be more employers that come on board, and I suppose it'd be interesting to see that because then it could maybe be a call go out to parts mm -hmm. of, of of NI that you know that haven't um, applied for that. No, that's a good point. Robin, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, sure, sure. Thank you, and um, maybe it's within the details of of the scheme itself, but <clears throat> I'd be very keen to understand if there are any qualifications that the young people can attain. Whilst they're whether it's NVQ or, or, or whatever um, uh, during the time, and indeed that the the uh, an assessment on, on the employer with his assessing the ability of the employer to in fact provide a structured training program and a monitored training program for the young person, and hopefully it would lead towards a qualification. Okay, again, we can ask that sure. question also. Go ahead, Fran. Sure. Sure. <coughs> There's a, 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 a two couple of things, and again, I think Kelly touched on her widespread it is across the north, but also I think that uh, in, in schemes like this in the past, what we uh, we, we miss out on is that the, 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 the broad community sector, you know, there's partnership boards, there's neighborhood renewal boards, there's things we actually are very clued into. The, uh, the what's happening in their, in their locality, and I've had experiences and some of bad experiences of what ha has happened at least in the past, and it would be interesting uh, to to uh, to seek out from the department. Uh, they, they, I know that they mentioned NICFA, but sometimes NICFA uh, isn't the 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 the, the, the uh, can't uh, be in contact with all the groups out there uh, that allows this broader thing. It allows it. Uh, People to get in touch with people who are, uh, are, are far removed from the, uh, the the employment scene. No, we can ask those questions as well, Fra. Thank you. Um, anybody else want to make a comment on that, or content and move on to the next item? Move on. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, members. Then can I ask you to turn to page thirty-two of your pack, where you'll see a departmental response in relation relation to the video relay service. Um, options in relation to the provision of the VRS are being considered by officials in the context of developing potential actions for inclusion in the disability strategy. All measures identified for potential inclusion in the disability strategy will be subject to cross-departmental consideration in relation to feasibility and affordability. Um, the response highlights that the work of, on the sign language bill, however, is being progressed in terms of cultural and linguistic diversity rather than under the disability uh, of deafness. Um, members, any comments on that or content to note? Go ahead, Kelly. Thank you, Chair. Um, I know we're, we're tied up this um, next period of time with the liquor licensing, but it would be very useful to get a, a, an update um, in person or in writing from the department on the progress of the linguistic um, issues that they've they've raised today. Um, I'm just keen that um, I appreciate that the Minister has a lot going on. Sign Language um, Act, as we know, wasn't on the list of legislation to be progressed until the end of this mandate. Um, but I'm just concerned that it will be left behind in, in that battle over linguistics. Um, if we could get an update from the Department on how that's progressing to make sure that, that we're not um, leaving sign language and um, communications options behind. Okay, we can ask that. Thank you, Kelly. Anybody else want to make comment on this or are they content to move on to the next item? Okay, content, okay. Um, members, could I then ask you to turn to page 33 where you'll find a departmental response in relation to the Living Over the Shop scheme. 
Uh, members, you may recall that the Department funded a pilot lot scheme from 2002 to 2009. I think the only person that might recall that will be Fra, uh, and it was operated by the Housing Executive. A total grant payment of 900,000 was provided to facilitate the creation or upgrade of 101 homes across Northern Ireland in seven years. Um, the scheme closed to new applications in 2009 due to budgetary constraints and because it is not clear uh, it was not clear it was delivering the anticipated outcomes. A review of the scheme was carried out by the public and corporate economic consultants in 2016, and a copy of the report is in your table papers. Um, members' response highlights the wide range of work that is now ongoing with a view to increasing the delivery of social and affordable housing, including in town and city centres, and given that the lot scheme did not previously significantly significantly achieve this increase, restarting lots is not aligned with current departmental housing priorities. Members, can I then just ask that we forward that response on to the Belfast Metropolitan Residence Group, who had sent this through to us a few weeks ago. Members happy enough with that? Mm -hmm. Content? Go ahead, Kelly. You want to say something? Sorry, yeah. Sorry, yes, Chair. Um, tied into this, um, in the Chamber the other day, the Finance Minister had identified with the changes coming in after COVID that there may be opportunities for um, civil service buildings to be changed in use. Um, as an outcome of this and considering town centre living, um, I'm wondering if we could write to um, the Minister for Communities and the Minister for Finance to see if there's any way that um, any civil service buildings, the public estate, that is no longer required for um, civil service office use or even floors and buildings that are no longer required for civil service office use, that they can be considered for could be the housing executive if if that could be the start of them building again or social housing to adapt those premises for town centre living um, in particular for social housing i would not like to see those buildings being sold off for hotels or private um, landlords it would be a useful thing for us to enable town, the limited amount of um, land that's available in town centres and city centres if if the civil service are not needing some of those office accommodation that it's made available for this purpose. Okay, we can ask those questions. Yeah. I don't know if there are any rules or regulations around that because of value for money and the, the price of some of that land that some of that might be sitting on. I, I do think there are certain rules around that, um, but we can certainly ask the question on it, Kelly, so we can. Fran, yeah. do you want to say something? <clears throat> yes, it did, Brian, you're right. Um, I, I didn't know why you were indicating because of my age that I, uh, that I would remember it back all them years ago. Uh, but uh, I do, I, I do believe that initially when this whole uh, scheme came up, uh, there there was some interest in it. But I, I thought back then what we were talking about is is cities, towns, uh, and towns, and the impact that it could have on the on the on the, on the thing. That I think it it, it did, didn't uh, uh, impact a, a big deal. But I think the minister was right now. I was speaking a, f a few months ago in the assembly. And uh, that there, there, that there, there's an adventurous, an adventurous housing plan uh, being put in place by the minister, and I think every all aspects of housing, including this, need to be taken in. But it needs to be part of an overall strategy uh, to allow you to, to, to deal with it. Because in the past, what it, what you were hoping that this would do is deal with some of the dereliction and some of the closed office spaces that there are in the, 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 the city centres. Yeah, and we know ourselves from our own constituencies in the areas right across the board that um, this will work in some areas and it won't work in other areas. Um, so I think you're right, Fra. I think that everything needs to be taken in on the round. Um, any other comments anybody wishes to make or happy that I move on to the next item? Yep, OK. And yeah. can, I, can I ask you to turn to page 36, where you'll see a departmental response to committee queries on SR 2021-67, Universal Credit Extension of Coronavirus Measures. Um, the response states that officials will continue to work closely with DWP officials to ensure that if the coronavirus measures are extended further, the department will make corresponding legislation and remain in parity with GB. Since the measures have been made using negative resolution procedure, they can be extended during recess if necessary. So I think Kelly, you had brought up that issue um, at last week or the week before's meeting. So uh, can I just ask our members content to note that yeah. response? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 
Okay, members, I am then going to move on to agenda item five, which is a departmental briefing on amendments to the pension schemes bill. Um, members, you'll find a copy of the bill at page 38 of your meeting packs, and the amendments start at page 86. Members, the committee reported on the pension schemes bill on the 19th of November 2020. However, we were made aware by officials during the committee stage that further amendments may be necessary at consideration, consideration stage in consequence of the Westminster Pensions Bill. Um, such amendments are now required and consist of technical drafting and consequential amendments required um, to the Assembly Pension Schemes Bill as a result of the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. There is nothing further for the committee to do, and we have the officials here today to explain the amendments to, to us. The Assembly has already agreed two legislative consent motions in relation to the Westminster Act in June and November last year, and the amendments being brought forward by the Department give effect to these changes that were sought under the LCMs. Um, so then can I welcome to the meeting, um, our, I don't see them, either of them there, Jerry McCann or Doreen Roy. Not, I'm just looking, they're not there, are they? They're on the phone. Oh, are they on the phone? They might be able to hear. There's a withheld number. Yeah, yeah. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. Is that good morning. Can you hear us okay? Yes. Yeah, it says Jerry here. I can hear. Hi. You. Good morning, everybody. Thanks very much for having us back again. Now we can hear some more about this bill. Oh, okay, Doreen, shall just make a very few um, short words here. Okay, by way of, of an opening statement. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, good morning. Thank you, Chair. Once again, we are pleased to have the opportunity to speak to you today about the Assembly Pension Scheme Bill. <coughs> During committee stage, we advised the committee that a number of amendments would be necessary at consideration stage in consequence of the Westminster Pension Scheme Bill, which at that time was before Parliament. Legislative consent motions in relation to the then Westminster Pension Scheme Bill were agreed by the Assembly on the 1st of June and 2nd of November 2020. The Westminster Bill has completed its passage through Parliament and is now the Pension Schemes Act 2021. We have briefed the Committee on a number of occasions in relation to both the Assembly Bill and what is now the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. Members will recall that the main provisions of the Assembly Bill provide for a new regulatory regime for Master Trusts, a form of multi-employer occupational pension scheme. To operate as a Master Trust, the scheme must be authorised by the Pensions Regulator. The Bill sets out specific requirements which must be met in order for a scheme to be authorised. For example, that persons involved with the scheme are fit and proper persons, that the scheme is financially sustainable, that the scheme meets requirements relating to systems and processes in relation to its administration and governance. The Bill also provides the regulator with powers for the ongoing supervision of master trusts, enabling it to intervene if schemes seem at risk of falling below the required standards. The Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 provides for collective money purchase schemes where contributions are pooled and invested to deliver an aspired benefit level. It strengthens protections for scheme members, enhances the powers of the regulator and introduces stronger sanctions for those who harm their pension schemes. It aims to increase transparency about individuals pensions by introducing pensions dashboards and introduces provisions to tackle pension scams. The Assembly Pension Schemes Bill and the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 both amend the same NI provisions in a number of cases. This has led to a conflict in the numbering of new provisions inserted by the Bill and the Act, as at the outset of both it was unclear which would progress more quickly. As the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 has been enacted, this necessitates amendments to the Assembly Bill to, rec to rectify the conflict in numbering. While in some instances the correction of numbering can be managed by the Assembly Bill Office, 
technical drafting amendments to Schedule 3 to the Bill are also required as a, as a consequence of this to reposition the renumbered provisions being inserted and some conjunctions. Amendments 1 to 6, 8 to 11 and 13 to 15 make the necessary technical amendments to reposition the renumbered provisions being inserted and some conjunctions. They do not denote new policy. Three further amendments to Schedule 3 are also necessary to carry amendments to NI provisions which could not be made by the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 as the Assembly Bill had not completed its passage through the Assembly. These amendments are necessary to maintain parity and interlinked provisions in this Bill with other NI private pensions legislation in a coherent way. These consequential amendments are technical, for example, to add in references to the Assembly Bill in a number of provisions amended by the Westminster Act. Amendments 7, 12, 16 make these necessary amendments. They do not denote new policy and in line with the legislative consent motions which would have been <coughs> passed the Act 2021 had the Assembly Bill been enacted at that time. I will briefly run through the proposed amendments to the Bill, if you are content. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. Okay, amendments 1 to 4, amendments 1 to 4 each make technical amendments as a result of the renumbering of a subparagraph being inserted into sections 96B and 97AI of the Pension Schemes NI Act 1993. This is in consequence of those sections also being amended by section 76.6 of and paragraph 3 of Schedule 6 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021, respectively. The technical amendments relate to the positioning of the subparagraph. Amendments 5 and 6 make technical amendments as a result of the renumbering of a subparagraph being inserted into Article 9.7 of the Pensions NI Order 1995. This is in consequence of Article 9 also being amended by Paragraph 13 of Schedule 6 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. The technical amendments relate to the positioning of the subparagraph and the conjunction. Turning to Amendment 7, this amendment inserts new paragraphs 9A to 9E into Schedule 3. These new paragraphs amend Articles 68, 72A, 72B, 75 and 75A of the Pensions NI Order 2005 articles which are either amended by or inserted by the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. The amendments made by paragraphs 9A to 9E are necessary to add a reference to this bill into provisions in those articles which refer to the relevant NI legislation. Paragraphs 10 and 21 of Schedule 8 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 amend Articles 68 and 75, respectively, of the Pensions NI Order 2005. Paragraph 11 of that schedule inserts Articles 72A and 72B. <coughs> paragraph 12 inserts Article 75A into the 2005 Order. In the corresponding GB provisions, the Act includes a reference to the Pension Schemes Act 2017, that is the GB analogue to the current bill. As the current bill had not completed its passage through the Assembly, the Act could not include a reference to this bill in Articles 68, 72A, 72B, 75 and 75A. The references therefore have to be added by this bill. Amendments 8 to 11 each make technical amendments as a result of the renumbering of subparagraphs being inserted into Articles 85, 88 
and 92 of the 2005 order. This is in consequence of those articles also being amended by paragraphs 14 to 16 of Schedule 6 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. The technical amendments relate to the positioning of the subparagraphs and in the cases of Amendment 9, a conjunction. Turning to Amendment 12, this amendment inserts new paragraph 12A into Schedule 3. This new paragraph amends paragraph 2, 2 of Schedule 1 to the 2005 order to add in references to provisions in this bill relating to fixed penalty notices and escalating penalty notices. Paragraph 27 of Schedule 8 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 amends paragraph 2, 2 of Schedule 1 to the 2005 order. In the corresponding GB provisions, the Act includes a reference to the Pension Schemes Act 2017. As the current bill had not completed its passage through the Assembly, the Act could not include references to provisions of this bill in paragraph 2, 2 of Schedule 1 to the 2005 order. The references, therefore, have to be added by this bill. Amendment 13 makes a technical amendment as a result of the renumbering of a part being inserted into Schedule 2 to the 2005 order. This is in consequence of another part being inserted into Schedule 2 to the 2005 order by Paragraph 21 of Schedule 6 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. The technical amendment relates to the positioning of the renumbered part within the schedule. Amendments 14 and 15 make technical amendments as a result of the renumbering of paragraphs being inserted into definitions in Section 31 of the Pensions No. 2 Act NI 2008. This is in consequence of other paragraphs being inserted into those definitions by Paragraph 22 3 of Schedule 6 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021. The technical amendments relate to the positioning of the paragraphs. Finally, Amendment 16 inserts new paragraphs 15 and 16 into Schedule 3. Paragraphs 15 and 16 carry amendments to clauses 17 and 18 of this bill once it has been enacted. The amendments cannot be made to the bill as it stands, as they need to be commenced at a future date in tandem with the corresponding changes to the Pension Schemes Act 2017, that's the GB analogue to the current bill, to maintain parity. Paragraphs 18 to 20 of Schedule 7 to the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 amend sections 17 and 18 of the Pension Schemes Act 2017. As the current bill had not completed its passage through the Assembly, the Act could not make corresponding amendments for NI. The amendments therefore have to be made by this bill. The intention is that these amendments will be commenced at the same time as the corresponding amendments to the Westminster Act. All of these amendments are in consequence of the Westminster Pension Schemes Act 2021 and do not denote new policy. I would add just one final point. It is possible that the numbering of the amendments may change subject to the views of the Bill Office. However, no substantive changes are envisaged. Thank you. We will do our best now to answer any questions you may have. Thank you very much, Doreen, and again, a very clear and detailed explanation you've given us here today. Um, members, none of you are in the spotlight at the moment, so if any of you do want to ask a question of Doreen or Jerry, can you please use your hands up function? I know I have no questions. I mean, these are purely technical and bring us into parity. Um, so therefore, uh, I have nothing further to ask. I don't see any member has indicated to ask anything further. No, there's no, no member has, has indicated. Look, Jerry and Doreen, look, thank you very much um, for joining us today again, unless there's anything you want to add. No, no, no. I'm sure, but they were very technical, as, as I'm sure that you gleaned from Dory's explanation there. But oh, okay, thanks for your time. No, thank you so much. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Dory. Okay, here. Thank thanks. you. Bye. Bye. -bye.
<coughs> Excuse me, members. Okay, members. Um, we will then. Yep. Broadcasting. If you can just bring all of the members in, that's good. I think you have done good stuff. So, members, you're all back into the spotlight again. Just to remind you that we can hear everything going on in your background as well when you're in the spotlight. Um, so, we're going to move on to agenda item six, which is committee de deliberations on the clauses of the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. Um, we will continue today with our deliberations and we'll also again have a closed session with Claire McCanny from the Bills Office um, after, at, at the latter part of the meeting. Members, the uh, papers for these, these is at page 94 and you also have two table papers prepared by the clerk um, for our reference showing the status of our deliberations on each clause at this point. So you'll see those tables which are excellent actually that set it out all very clearly and also then I just want to draw your attention to some correspondence we have received. Um, at page 104 of your packers reply from the PSNI on the estimated additional costs associated with proposed late night opening. The PSNI propose, or sorry, response is based on pubs and hotels also being able to use the 104 nights on a Monday through to Thursday night. If taken to the extreme of late openings throughout the week, it is assessed that in order to meet this demand, um, will necessitate necessitate necessi 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 can't even say that necessi say that for me, please. Necessitate, <laughs> necessitate the use of significant overtime with an annual cost of as high as seven million pounds, um, dependent upon um, take up. The PSNI point out that any changes to variable shift arrangements are challenging and must meet their obligations arising from the European Working Time Regulations. Um, in its original written submission to us, the PSNI highlight, highlighted that the Article 45 um, police authorization, authorizations for additional permitted hours for small pubs had not been widely used in the last number of years. Um, so, members, any comments they wish to make on that um, correspondence from the PSNI. I know certainly when they were in in front of us, they had, uh, from what I can remember anyway, had said that if, if these were weekends only, they could more than manage that um, and it wouldn't cost them uh, uh, any real uh, uh, money. Um, but I suppose then they've come back. We did ask them to put if they could put a figure on that and they've come back with that figure. Um, uh, Sinead, do you have your hand up? No, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, members, no, any we are sorry. No, no. You're all right. You're okay. Uh, members, any comments they want to make on that? Or are they content to note then that uh, correspondence from the PSNI? I think, Chair. Go ahead. <clears throat> I think it's, it's um, the point being made by the, the PSNI is that if the, um, the extent, the, the potential extent of, of the uh, alliance is taken up, then they would be under considerable pressure. £7 million pounds to that budget is a significant amount of money. I don't think we can just note it, but I do think, Chair, uh, your agreement and the committee's agreement, I think we should um, express our concerns that there was the potential of a, a budget that the PSNI are, a budget requirement that the PSNI are not in a position to fulfil at this moment in time. Um, given the pressure that the PSNI budget seems to be under in terms of recruitment uh, for, for additional staff and so on. So it, it, it is not an insignificant amount of money to the organisation, but That's I don't think we can just note it, Chair. No, and I know that is that is one of the reasons why we're looking at, at reviews and review clauses, and I know um, we'll talk about it later on, um, the Minister... Um, I think I'm pretty certain um, was looking at, at the possibility of a review clause around the late night opening. Um, I certainly felt whenever the PS and I came in and briefed us at the time during their witness session, they didn't flag any major concerns at all, um, which I find really quite surprising. Um, but now we have it in, in writing that there are concerns. Um, I think that's why it's it's very it's you know important that that is part of the review. Then is looking at the PS and I budget and how it's been impacted. Um, by any further extensions to any of the licensing laws. Um, so I don't think we will. I mean, it certainly won't be ignored in any way. Um, I think it will be part of our report and part of the reason why we want to have a review uh, of, of that issue. Members, any other comments they want to make on that piece of correspondence? 
No, happy I move on. Okay then members, can I ask you then to turn to page 105 and you'll see a letter <coughs> from a, a group called Free the Night. Um, this appears to be a group that has recently formed after reviewing what has been brought forward for the licensing and registration of clubs amendment bill. The group feels that the proposed licensing changes are not based on any type of international model or best practice. In its view, the new legislation is not a step forward and does nothing to help attract people into our towns and cities and make Northern Ireland a less desirable location for locals and tourists alike. The group requests that opening hours are extended further, uh, with the standard closing times in Europe being between 6 and 8 a.m., uh, with many having the ability to, 20, for, to trade 24 hours if they wish. Um, the group is aware of the 104 late licences uh, will be available. However, they feel that venues should be able to benefit from late trading throughout the year. The group also states that licensing law changes with regard to aligning alcohol and entertainment licence is based on a decision from 2016, and they feel this calls for re-examination, <coughs> and the group would like to see a mechanism to bring our cities in line with the rest of the UK and Europe and believe that the bill will have a detrimental effect on the industry. Um, members, this did come through very late, and I know that um, as a committee, and uh, we went out widely to consultation. Uh, we extended our consultation. We published the consultation very, very well. Um, so I, I don't think that the committee um, are at fault there in any way. And certainly, my belief is through the evidence sessions that we have got. Um, we're, we're, we will end up with a pretty balanced um, bill, but that's my view. Can I just ask uh, members, have they any comments they wish to make on this piece of correspondence? Or are they content to note it? Go ahead, Kelly. Sure, thanks very much, Chair. Um, the, some members of the group had been in contact with myself, um, and I did reiterate that we had been consulting for a considerable length of time. But I think that the concern here is conflating two issues, and one of them has nothing to do with our bill. So, to, unless I'm reading this wrong, so at the moment, what this group are looking for is that entertainment can continue on. And I know I was asking questions was last week or the previous week. Um, just for clarification, from my own point of view, my, if my understanding was correct. So any venue that wants to continue on entertainment beyond the drinking up time um, can certainly do so, but they negate the liquor license, and I think, um, and we can check that with officials. I believe that if a, a venue wants to continue entertainment, they can do so if that's within their entertainment licence, which is out with this one. But the liquor licensing is as stands. Um, I know that, I think that we have it in it that entertainment should, if you have applied for a late licence and then that additional drinking up time, the entertainment should stop at the end of that time. And that's to do with the nighttime economy, concerns for health and placing. But if anyone wants to run an entertainment further than that, then I believe that would be for an entertainment licence, not the liquor licensing. Okay, like we can, uh, Liam and Carol will be in uh, shortly. Yeah. I've been asked if they're, they're listening in, so that I'll bring them in shortly and they can certainly answer those uh, queries, Kelly. Anybody else want to make comment on this or are they content then that uh, we, we, we note? No, uh, Chair, could I declare an interest, please? And just, uh, I suppose you used the, the, the word balanced, uh, and I think, I think that was appropriate. I think what we are doing is, is attempting very much to, to, to strike a balance. We've mm -hmm. given massive consideration to this, and even had we had representation from the, this group earlier, I don't think it would have shaped where we are uh, any differently, particularly. No, thank you, Mark. Um, thank you for that. Um, are members then happy I move on then to um, next item I want to talk about? Yes? Yeah? Okay. okay. Um, also then, we re yesterday we received a joint written submission from the Northern Ireland Brewery, an independent pub association and the Society for Indep Independent Brewers on the matter of tap rooms. The submission is in your tabled paper for consideration in our closed session um, later in the meeting. Are members content then with that approach and um, are happy that we move on? Yeah? Yeah. Okay, good stuff, yeah, thank you. Okay, members, then we are going to then bring in uh, Carol and Liam into the spotlight. So can I bring both of them in, please? There we are. 
Hi, Arius. Good morning. You're very welcome again this week. Morning, Chair. Morning. morning. Just before we start, do you can either of you um, give a response to Kelly on those queries that she raised? Uh, yes, of course, Chair. Um, Kelly's quite right in her understanding. There's two separate regimes: uh, entertainment licensing and uh, liquor licensing. The uh, alignment of the two is, is, is brought forward really at the request of the police, but also at request of other license holders, uh, because in the past we have had uh, illegal sales past normal closing time, where the uh, entertainment license ran on maybe two, three o'clock in the morning. Um, this uh, reform here uh, allows uh, legal entertainment with a liquor licence and drinking up time to 3am, uh, which uh, the Minister believes is, is balanced, as, as the Chair said at the start. Uh, it doesn't make a significant change to our nighttime economy. Uh, now, if, if someone wishes to run entertainment right through to 8am, for example, uh, they, then their liquor licence would finish at 11pm the day before. Yeah. Uh, and this is uh, really, I mean, th there could be some sort of entertainment run through the night where, where, where drink isn't needed, maybe a charity event or something. So that's why we've uh, formulated the act or the bill in that way. Okay, Kelly. Yeah, yeah, no, that was my understanding too. Um, so if, if anyone if from any from the group want to continue on entertainment, they certainly can do so and they can deal with that through their entertainment license. But as far as liquor licensing is concerned, if they want to take the additional hours um, and bring enough time to end at three o'clock, that's that. If they want to, um, just for entertainment value, to have that entertainment, then the liquor licensing ends at 11 and they can continue on to whatever time their entertainment license will allow them to do so. So I think that answers a question. Um, it, it separates alcohol from entertainment, um, you know, for those groups that want to continue on entertaining um, much beyond three o'clock in the morning. Okay, look, thank you. That clears that up then. So we'll then um, move on. Um, then can I just draw your attention to page 102 of your packs, which is a departmental response to queries raised in last week's meeting. Um, if you can turn then to clause 29, which is young people prohibit, prohibited from bars. Um, the committee mm -hmm. had requested that the minister adds to the amendments already agreed for this clause by ensuring that the bill contains regulation making powers in order to be able to amend the number of months referred to in 29.1 and the number of prize giving ceremonies referred to in 29.3, should this become necessary in the future. The Minister has accepted the request and will take forward as a departmental amendment. Can I then ask members, are they content with the Minister's commitment to take forward this amendment? Yes, content? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. Stop. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Then I'll turn to the issue of cinemas. The committee noted the department's concerns regarding an amendment in primary legislation allowing alcohol to be sold in cinemas without public consultation. The committee discussed the way forward proposed by the Department of Three Consultation pending legal advice to determine if there is an opportunity in current legislation to include cinemas within the definition of a place of public entertainment via regulations. The committee was minded to support this proposal provided a short focused consultation takes place over July and August of this year with regulations being brought forward to the Assembly in autumn of this year. Um, as at its last at this meeting last week, the committee requested that the minister confirms in writing her agreement to this timetable. The department's response now states that legal advice has confirmed that cinemas could be included in the definition of a place of public entertainment by regulations. The minister has instructed officials to carry out a short, focused public consultation over the summer months. The Minister will consider the responses to the consultation and subject to no serious concerns being raised, regulations will be brought to the Assembly in the autumn. Can I then ask members have they any comments or if they are content uh, with the Minister's commitment to carry out a consultation and bring regulations to the Assembly in the autumn? Um, any, can I ask member? Any comments? Are they content with that? Yeah, yeah, just, Chair, uh, ju just in terms of the consultation, give, given that uh, some cinemas, if not all, all cinemas across the North, have responded in, <laughs> in, in some format or other to the ongoing process and consultation, will that be carried across or will they have to repeat all that work? 
I'm going to ask that of Liam and Carol. <coughs> Chair, I believe if they've already responded, we could just carry it across, but they would have an opportunity if they had anything to add to, to, to add. This one will be a public consultation again. It will be issued to everybody on the on the stakeholder list and the Section 75 list um, that, that the department would follow for any consultation, so they absolutely have an opportunity to come back. Okay, thanks, Ron. Okay, does any members have any further questions that they want to ask of Liam and Carol at this stage? No? no. Okay. Um, can I then just ask, just very quickly, of, of both of you, um, any idea when we will see any of the ministerial amendments um, uh, coming forward to committee? Because we, until we see those, we can't then, as you know, progress on to do our clause by clause. <clears throat> Oh, we're both going to speak at the same time. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is, work, this work, is difficult. They've not been in the same room. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. Um, work has commenced, Chair. So um, we have worked with the drafts person. We are part way through in terms of um, our instructions to, to Council, and Council has actually provided some drafts back to us, um, which we will now consider. Um, once we have all those together, um, we will obviously have to share those with Minister for clearance. But um, officials are working and OLC are committed to doing it as soon as practically possible. Um, obviously, we just need the time to make sure um, that uh, the, 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 the instructions or the, the draft um, amendments that have been provided work within not just the bill, but the overall order um, and any consequentials then that we pick up on to make sure that it's done correctly. No, that's fine. Look, thank you for that. Um, I have nothing further then, so can I thank you both again for being with us today? And I think under the, we have the same understanding for later, if we need you to come in later, um, we'll certainly give you a shout and ask you. Is that grand? Certainly, yes. Chair, yes. Okay. That's fine, Chair. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Liam. Thanks, uh, Carol. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Okay, members, we're going to move then to agenda item seven, which is correspondence. You'll find the memo at page 320 of your pack. Um, can I draw your attention to... Um, correspondence in relation to the Caravans Act at page 465. Members, back in November, we contacted the Department about this subject due to other correspondence we had received. The Department advised the responsibility for the legislation around caravans is shared, as we know, between the Department for Communities and the Department for the Economy, and that the Department for Communities' primary purpose is in this legislation is in relation to part one of the Act and those people who live on a caravan park or site as their permanent residence. However, it is part two of the Caravans Act 2011 that contains specific legislation controlling the arrangements between park owners and those renting caravan pitches for more than 28 days. Um, that is the responsibility for the Department for the Economy. Um, so I just wanted to, to put that out there and, and, and read that into the record as well. Can I then just go to members and ask, if it, first of all, if you have any comments on, on that uh, piece of correspondence? No? Okay, Kelly, go ahead. Sorry, Chair, I was just going to say thank you so much for that clarification because I was getting nowhere with that fast. Um, the fact that, that we can look at when people live there permanently um, clarifies that completely um, therefore I know that the Committee for Infrastructure I think it was has forwarded us on that correspondence actually that's for economy to deal with yeah no that's why we brought this up then you know just for members to have clarity as well as to where we yeah. sit around the Caravans Act okay members I have nothing further on our correspondence memo can I ask then do any members have anything they want to bring up under correspondence and if not then are they content then with the the, the memo Kelly go ahead do we not have to discuss a page I think it's 353 um, we've been asked um, about engagement with marginalized groups do we want to do that this week or are we going to bring that back then with me because my, my computer has gone off. The joy. The joy, I know. Bear with me, just yeah, I go into correspondence. Um, which one is it, Kelly? The 353, um, it's the one from um, Nick Henry, the clerk, yes. um, had written to us about the engagement with marginalised groups. 
Yeah, we do have quite some time to get back to him. To okay. Yeah. Today, so I think clerk has just sent to me this. Will we will discuss this because uh, we have to have a response back by the seventeenth of May. So, so it wasn't for this. We will we will discuss it though. Apologies, should have added that into the notes. No, that's quite okay. All right. No, thank you for bringing that up, Kelly. Um, anybody else? Anything they want to bring on, up under correspondence, or can I ask then? Are you content to note the memo? Content. Um, sorry, Claire. Can I ask? Um, could we ask a question just following on from debates and petitions? Five one seven. Um, I know that in our forward work plan, the, um, the conversion therapy. We know the minister is working on this. I've met with the minister, and she's discussed. You know that, that there is background work going on. Um, just with everything that's happening, perhaps we could get a written um, update on, on what she's thinking. I know it's not in our forward work plan for legislation in this mandate, but it's just even if we can confirm the work that she's doing um, and, and how that's progressing for her. Yep, absolutely. You can ask that question. Yep. And any other members, anything they want to bring up? OK, so we're happy enough then uh, with our, our correspondence memo. Um, as as changed, I suppose, not as drafted with some of those amendments to it. Yeah. Okay. All right, members. I'm going to then ask you then to move on to agenda item eight, which is forward work program. Um, members at the meeting on the 29th of April, we will continue with our deliberations on the licensing bill, and then I'm going to ask you to turn or go to agenda item nine, which is any other business. Um, members, any other business I want to bring up at this stage? No. Okay. Uh, but, sorry, go ahead, Chair. Uh, it was just now I had noticed the press release that went out from the Department of Society that the Minister yesterday it was on Neighbourhood Renewal Fund. I wonder if possible could we get a, a briefing on Neighbourhood Renewal in, in, the, in the near future just to, to hear how things are, are, are going there. We can see outgoings, yeah. but we ain't keen to hear more about outcomes as well. Okay, I think then in the first dance instance we ask them for uh, to send us through their written briefing, and then we will bring them in. I, I think you're right. I think it's a very it's an important subject, um, and something that the committee should be part of, uh, of of hearing just what those what those anticipated outcomes um, are. So if well, members are yeah. happy enough, we'll do that in the first instance. We'll ask for a written, written briefing to give us the details that we require around it, and then we will get them in for a evidence session after that. Members agreed? Yeah. Sure. yeah. Go yeah. ahead. Sorry. I, I anticipated, and we begin to hear anticipated yeah. outcomes, but they have to be based on actual outcomes yeah. to date as well, and, and what has been achieved through neighbourhood renewal thus far. Okay, thanks, Mark. In terms of closing the gaps between communities, as it was set up to do. Thank you, Mark. Robin, you wanted to come in? Yeah, yeah I, I noticed the statement here, and I concur with Mark that we should have. I'm just wondering, is that not uh, a statement that the minister should have brought to the chamber? Uh, the significance of it? Um, I, I don't know what the regulations are around that. I know that we have had statements uh, that do sometimes go to the chamber and others that are just done via press releases. No, I agree with um, Mark. It's a significant. Yeah. Uh, I would have thought that it would have been uh, brought. To, I thought it would have been brought to the cha to, to, to the chamber for uh, to allow us to have a question and answer session with the Minister on it. Well, we can ask that question as well as to why that <coughs> didn't happen and you know, what is the, 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 the format around that. Uh, you probably would know better than most of us being a former speaker. So you do. Well, I, 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 well, let me say, I would have expected it, Chair. Yeah, right, OK, I mean, OK. No, look, we can ask that question as well. Um, members, any other <coughs> comments under AOB? Are we happy we move on? Move on, OK. Then we're going to go to agenda item 10, which is date, time and location of our next meeting. Um, at this stage, our next meeting will be held on Thursday, the 29th of April, 2021, 9.15, here in room 29. Albeit, um, we have booked for a session for Tuesday if we do need it, um, but we'll decide that at the end of the meeting. So members agreed with that? Yeah, yeah agreed. Okay. All right, members now are going to go into closed session now to carry out our discussion with Claire. So then can I ask that broadcasting bring in Claire McCanny into the spotlight? There we go, there's Claire in. I'm now going to go into closed session.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.